Hello, my name is Russell Myers. Welcome to Issues Unite. All right, so, uh, yeah, I, I look a little blurry right now. I'm having camera issues. Uh, yep, this is not my normal camera. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> anyway, um, I, I'll be back to my normal camera, uh, you know, in the next day or two. So, yeah, I'm not trying to, like, filter anything out. Yes, I've got wrinkles. Okay, uh, especially right here. And uh, I admit to it. I'm not trying to hide shit. Uh, anyway, so with this current setup, yeah, you can see what kind of organized chaos um, that I tend to uh, hide from the camera most of the time. Um, uh, at least with this setup, I can wear my glasses to a degree. I still get this effect if I look up too much. Um, you know, yeah, and in the background, you can see more of my daughter's artwork. Um, right there. Uh, yes, if you don't know what that is, my daughter made me a painting of the uh, poster for the movie Logan's Run, which will tell you just how much of a geek I really am. That's one of my favorite movies of all time. Not least of which was, be uh, as a teenager, was because of Jenny Agutter in a toga. Uh, but, <laughs> yes, 40 years, 40 some years later, I still remember that. Um, and, <laughs> but it also tells you just how much of a, an anti-establishment geek I was even at the time. Um, going to say I, I kind of sympathize with my daughter, uh, being a teenager. Well, it's kind of hard being, um, rebellious when your father is more rebellious than you are. Uh, she started leaning a little bit more in a conservative direction, at least a little bit more to the right than me for a while. But I just let other influences take over, not least of which being her preference for anime and uh, the fact that she's attending a mostly black, artistic, creative magnet school in Alabama. Yeah, uh, any conservative leaning there just went right out the window. It was like, welcome back, kid. <laughs> yes, you are my child. <laughs> and nothing's going to change that. All right, so let's go into this. All right, so... Um, I've said that I was covering all of uh, Biden's executive actions for his first 100 days. I haven't done anything for a few days, but neither has he. Um, there was nothing Friday, nothing Saturday, nothing today. Um, you know, about the last thing that he did was, uh, you know, the prisons to, uh, you know, reduce, not eliminate, but reduce the number of private prisons being used by the federal government. And I, I and a number of other progressive uh, outlets have already covered that this uh, barely makes any impact at all. This affects maybe 16,000 inmates at most out of a prison population in the United States of over 2 million. Over 2 million. 16,000 out of 2 million. I, I praise the effort, but it didn't go, it does not go far enough. All right? Not by a long shot, obviously. Um, you know, some steps that he could have taken, which would have more of an impact. How about that uh, promise to decriminalize marijuana at, at the federal level? You know, 
I mean, this would have far more of an impact even at the state levels of, you know, reducing the use of private prisons. Okay? Uh, this decriminalized marijuana in all forms, in any amount, for adult use and for medicinal use for children. Okay? Just decriminalize it at the federal level. Allow research to be done with it, you know, because right now it's still a Schedule I drug so that even research is illegal at the federal level. So, so how about that? You know, that would be a major step if he had included a press release with this to encourage the state and municipal authorities to reduce or eliminate the use of uh, private, you know, for-profit prisons. That would have also been extremely helpful. But none of this occurred. And I'm not holding my breath on any of it. Okay, so there is far more that can be done. I know a lot of people think that some of my ideas are, you know, radical or, or something. I've been saying it's not like any of my messaging has changed. I was saying the exact th same things under Trump and many of the same things under Obama. So this is not a big, this is not a change. It wasn't, it hasn't been radical under Trump. It wasn't radical under Obama. It's not radical or irrational now. There, there's nothing unreasonable or unrealistic in any way to anything that I'm saying. It, it, it's highly achievable. It can be done with the stroke of a pen in one day. There's so much that can be done that can be included with the executive actions he has already taken, but he did not include these additional steps. If I can come up with these things, with his panel of advisors and his 48 years in office, 47 of which he, uh, he opposed any legalization of marijuana until last year. Last year was the first time that he even budged to the left on this subject. And then look who he names as his vice president, Kamala Harris, who put people in prison for marijuana use and kept people in prison, in jail, even after a judge told her to release them for nonviolent offenses. This is who he names as his vice president. So if you're thinking he's going to move to the left on this anytime soon, then, you know, we'll see. You'll, you keep telling me to be patient. Okay, how patient? How long do we need to wait? How long? Be clear. Because I like numbers. I, I like specifics. All right? Um... Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Israel, Palestine. All right, he's talking about peace, but his actual efforts, again, fall very short. Uh, with Yemen, he says that he is going to stop backing the, um, you know, the Saudi... Um, aggressions toward Yemen. All right, how about 
hosting peace talks? How about mandating peace talks? Moderated by the United States. Okay, Let, let's do that. His efforts do not include removing the State Department classification of the Houthi rebels as a terrorist organization. Keep in mind that the uh, conflict in Yemen is happening in Yemen. And the United States is backing Saudi Arabia if even one attack. There are daily numerous attacks and, and people dying by the tens of thousands every week in Yemen. But one attack comes, happens on Saudi territory and what happens? Wait, all of a sudden, we're all on Saudi's side. Keep in mind, let's keep in mind that, you know, Khashoggi, the journalist, chopped to pieces. That happened in Saudi Arabia. Keep in mind that the Saudis have backed, you know, Al-Qaeda, at least part of ISIS. Fifteen of the 19 terrorists on 9-11 came from Saudi Arabia. So even while he says that he is, um, you know, going to stop backing Saudi Arabia, I I'm not really seeing it. Uh, he has implied, implied but not said, that he will stop selling offensive weapons to Saudi Arabia. Well, let's, let's go to what's behind the scenes here. All right, so. Saudis expanding U.S. military access to airfields port to counter Iran. We'll get to Iran in another video. All right. The U.S. military is expanding its ability to operate from Saudi Arabia in the event of a war with Iran, striking a preliminary arrangement with Riyadh to use various air bases and seaports in the country's western regions. Uh, and this is from DefenseOne.com. All right, I'm going to skip over most of this. This expansion initiative has been underway for at least a year. Its revelation comes as the new Biden administration has vowed to take a more skepti skeptical eye toward the relationship with Saudi Arabia and to attempt negotiations with Iran for an updated version of the Iran nuclear deal that then President Trump abandoned in 2018. But it hints at the seriousness with which military leaders at U.S. Central Command, which governs all American troops in the Middle East, takes the possibility of a war with Tehran. And it signals that even as the Biden administration has sought to take a tougher line on Riyadh, U.S.-Saudi ties are deepening at the military level. Let's skip on down here. But even as the admi as administration officials have insisted that they will take a tougher line on Saudi Arabia, Biden referred to Riyadh as a pariah during the Democratic primary debates and promised it would pay the price for the Khashoggi killing, they have continued to defend the strategic partnership. In a Sunday statement from State Department spokesman uh, Ned Price condemning a drone attack on Riyadh, the administration committed to help our partner Saudi Arabia defend against ta attacks on its territory. I think the Biden administration does have wiggle room it's a question of can Washington walk and chew gum at the same time. Um, on the macro issues, the Saudi are, Saudis are with us. I think the administration can do things like get tough on human rights without having to sacrifice the strategic relationship. So, very clearly, 
You know, there, what kind of a difference is this? All right, we're keeping U.S. troops, U.S., uh, you know, facilities in Saudi, in Saudi Arabia. Okay, let's go to another article here. All right. Raytheon expects Biden to block $500 million bomb sale to Saudi Arabia. All right, we had assumed that we were going to get a license to provide these offensive weapons systems to our customer, Hayes, from Raytheon said. With the change in administration, it becomes less li- likely that we're going to be able to get a license for this. And so we appropriately decided that we could no longer support the booking of that contract. During a Senate confirmation hearing last week, now confirmed Secretary of State Anthony Blinken said the Biden administration would end our support for the military campaign led by Saudi Arabia and Yemen. But this is all words. These are, it's all words. Still, Hayes said the company does not, does not anticipate issues selling defensive weapons like Patriot missile interceptors and other types of arms in the region. Lockheed Martin CEO uh, Jim Teglet expected foreign arms sales to remain a priority in the Biden administration. As far as international business, including foreign military sales, the tendency of people in the Biden administration and in the president's own statements reiterate his view that alliances are important, that they need to be cultivated, and that they have real value in deterrence and national defense, Takelet said. I do think that we'll have a more open environment for foreign military sales and direct commercial sales to our international partners. Now, pay attention to this. Takelet said foreign weapon sales are a way to generate American jobs and stimulate the U.S. economy. You know what else? creates jobs and stimulates the economy. Uh, Let's try infrastructure, roads, bridges. How about schools? How about health care? How about providing food to people that are hungry and waiting in line for food banks? How How about selling food to other countries? Huh? I mean, that would generate jobs, wouldn't it? Still, to take let a former U.S. Air Force pilot said, arms sales are a way to deepen relationships with an ally. I can tell you that there's no better way to get a tighter bond with an ally than sell them by a jet fighter aircraft. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, you're going to tell Saudi Arabia, "Oh, we don't back you, but we're still going to sell you weapons." We're going to claim that this creates jobs. And all those things I just mentioned, infrastructure, you know, schools, healthcare, food. How many people does that kill? How many enemies do you make in providing these things, in building these things up? Yeah, you don't kill anyone doing these things. And they create a lot more jobs and a lot more wealth and a lot more prosperity and a lot more education, a lot more safety and security for this country, for the world than bombs do. All right, I'm cutting this one off here. Um, Share this video. Talk about these subjects. Stop calling these ideas radical. Stop telling me to have patience. You're not the ones being bombed. You're not the one in prison. You're not, but you're the one paying for the bombs. You're the one paying for the corporate prisons. 
You're paying in so many ways that you can't even imagine. Start thinking about this. If you can, please uh, donate a dollar a month to help expand the channel, and I will catch you in the next one.